You can see me today, can't you? Because I'm on the step. I was sit, standing here last night thinking, I was standing down here thinking, boy, this is a big pulpit. <laughs> this is tailor-made for Tim. Now you can see me, so that, that's good. Um, great to be with you again. Ha- so hands up if you were here last night. Just give me an idea. Also oh, quite, a, quite a few of you. Okay, that's good. So last night we had a kind of a bigger, bigger session to really set the scene. Um, if you turn in the Bibles to the letter of Jude, so I think uh, if, you go, if you know where Revelation is, the back of the Bible, get to Revelation, turn left. And you've got Jude. It's a good way of remembering it. I'm not going to read the whole letter like we did last night. Um, I'm just going to read uh, the last part of the letter from which I'm going to get the last two lessons from Jude. Last night we saw three lessons uh, from Jude and made application to same-sex orientation and transgenderism. And this morning, we're going to do two more lessons from Jude and make application uh, to these issues, and then how we should respond um, pastorally or uh, as Christians. Um, I'm going to have a time of of question and answer at the end. I want to try and leave a good amount of time because we got a few good questions last night, but uh, I think these issues provoke more and more questions of application along the way, and, and there can be some tricky areas that we want to deal with sensitively but, but biblically. But let me just read a few verses, and then I'll pray, and then we'll start. Uh, this is the letter of Jude, and I'm going to start in verse... 17, and I'm reading from the ESV, so if there's a few little translation differences, don't worry about that. Verse 17, but you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there'll be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people, devoid of the spirit, but you, beloved, building yourselves up in, the, in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. And let us pray now. And dear Lord, as we come to your word, I pray that we would uh, get under your word, that you would cause us to submit to your word, and that you would give us understanding uh, of your word, that we may be more and more uh, conformed to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. And as we deal with these um, powerful and big issues of sexuality, um, I pray that you would give us clear and biblical thinking in an age of confusion, that we may glorify you and do others good. And I pray this in Jesus' name. So we're going to finish off Jude uh, in this second session on same-sex orientation and transgenderism. And then uh, the third session, or the second session this morning, is going to be on uh, biblical parenting in, in a world turned upside down. So how do we then engage in parenting uh, our children in this age? Um, If you do remember last night, I'll just recap very, very briefly. Um, I mentioned a a, a quote at the beginning of the session from Daniel Heimbach um, when he said that while sexuality will not be the only thing contested, the Bible indicates that the way people respond to God's standards for sex in these last days will be a very significant factor in determining who is on his side and who is not, who is a Christian and, and who is not. And I laid out that there is a conflict going on, a cosmic conflict, a war against God and against his people. And we, the church, are involved in this conflict. Um, 
that we live in a culture which makes it very difficult to engage in the conflict because it's a culture that very much uh, is a culture of victimhood and offence so that um, if I say to you that you are wrong about something, you're immediately then offended and a victim of my so-called abuse or hurt. So it then tends to cause us to pull back from these issues especially on issues like homosexuality and transgenderism, these things are in a de direct uh, affront to God and we, we fear man more than God and so we don't actually address the issue. I also said that there was a, in our culture today, we're in a big deception going on. There's a moral deception that's happened that says LGBT is good, morally good. And if the culture is convinced of that, then if you say with all the love in the world, no, it's not good according to God's word, then you're considered unloving. You're considered a bigger, you're even considered illegal. That's the way it's, it's moving. Um, it's moving in a linguistic deception. So we see language is changing nowadays. There's a media deception. We're desensitized at first to these issues. Then people like Christians are demonized or mocked as being anti-LGBT organizations. Um, and then they demand, they demand you must accept now what we must say and you must call us what we say and we will now infiltrate your education systems. And so it won't stop, it's, it's, it's moving and it's, it's spreading. And so we really need to rely on the word of God. We need to have a clear view of the scriptures. Last night I mentioned, and, and as, as we go along, if there's any definition, if there's any words I say that you think, oh, what, what does that mean? He hasn't explained that. Um, in the Q&A, Feel free to say, oh, you said that. Just Can you explain what that means? Or come up to me afterwards. But I mentioned binary sexes last night. We need to affirm binary sexes. Binary sexes is simply this. In Genesis 1.27, God made us male and female in his image. There are only two sexes, binary sexes. And that's what God created. So no matter what the world is telling you there's a third sex or there's other sex. No, there are only two. We must affirm binary sexes from the scriptures, from the first pages of scripture in Genesis 1 and 2. We must affirm that binary sexes are then made for marriage between one man and one woman for life and that children are then the fruit of that marriage and that a man and a woman fit together in marriage in a complementarian way. I, I, mentioned, I mentioned complementarity, how men and women are created binary sexes, but equal in the image of God, in value, but very different physically and also functionally in the way that we fit together. And then I moved into the, into the lessons from Jude. And if you remember, um, I pointed us to the purpose verse of the letter. And you see it there in verse 3. Beloved, although I was very eager to write you about our common salvation... So Jude wanted to give them all the good and positive stuff about being saved and, and Jesus coming again and, and, and all of this. But he said, I wanted to write about our common salvation, but I found it necessary or a necessity to write appealing to you, and here it is, to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. He said, this is what I need to tell you this. I want to write to you about these things, but I need to tell you, you need to contend. And you need to contend for the faith. And he's writing to all Christians here. So the first lesson was that you all need to contend. Every Christian. It's not for super Christians. There are no super Christians. Just ordinary Christians like us. And we're all called to contend. And we're called to contend for the faith. What is the faith? The faith isn't your personal faith that you exercise. It is the faith, the scriptures, doctrine. And we need to contend, the third lesson was against false teachers, because it says in verse 4, for certain people have crept in unnoticed. And later on in that verse, it says, they pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. And I spoke about the character of the false teacher. So we all need to contend. We need to contend for the faith, that is, the doctrine. And we need to contend against false teachers, which bring in false teaching. Okay, they're the first three lessons. And the application I made that was a lot of these false teachers, their lifestyles are steeped in sexual immorality and they're teaching things 
that actually pervert God's word on sexual morality. And then if you remember, I mentioned that one of the key things is the whole LGBT Christian theology. That you can be a Christian and affirm to some degree uh, a, an LGBT orientation or the d- desires themselves are not sinful as long as you don't follow them through. And so what we found is this is crept into the church. I said it's crept in almost unnoticed and it's damaging. And we, we talked quite a bit about that and there were some good questions afterwards. So they're the, the first three lessons. We must all contend. We must all contend for the faith and for doctrine, particularly in these areas of sexuality. And we must all contend against false teachers who bring in false teaching. Because the biggest danger to the church is not from the outside, it is from the inside. So the big job of pastors and elders in your church is to protect sound doctrine. But there is a responsibility on the congregation to be protecting sound doctrine and contending for the faith. Okay. Lesson four, and I've only got two lessons this morning. Lesson four is this. We need to keep ourselves in the love of God. We need to keep ourselves in the love of God. The the text that I read uh, this morning begins with a but. So there's a contrast here. But you must remember, beloved, so Jude is speaking to the church, those who are beloved of Jude, but beloved of God, it says in verse one. He's speaking to 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 the beloved, to the Christians. He says in verse 18 that, you know, in the last time there will be scoffers, there will be these false teachers come in following their ungodly passions, that they do cause divisions, verse 19. They're worldly people. They're devoid of the spirit. They're not Christians. Again, verse 20, but you, beloved, in contrast to them, building yourself up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. The central command there is keep yourselves in the love of God. We need to contend for the faith with false teachers, but we need to keep ourselves in the love of God so we won't compromise with their false teaching. Keep yourselves in the love of God. How do we do that? And we do that with three ing words. So here's how you look at the scriptures. You know, you, you find that central clause, keep yourself in the love of God. And then these ing words describe how. Building, verse 20, building yourselves up in your most holy faith. Praying, second part of verse 20, praying in the Holy Spirit. And then second part of verse 21, waiting. Waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. So building, praying, and waiting. So how do we keep ourselves in the love of God? Building yourselves up in your most holy faith. That's the, the first way that we do it. So we, we build ourselves up. We grow in our knowledge of the gospel and our knowledge of the scriptures. So in the LGBT conflict, this battle, this conflict in which we're contending for the faith, we must set our minds right theologically. And that means having a Christian, a biblical worldview. See, there are only two forces dividing the culture and church over sexual morality. There's biblical Christianity and then there's paganism, that which is not Christian. Biblical sexuality and pagan sexuality. So a theologian called Abraham Kuyper said this, the fundamental contrast has always been and still is and will be until the end, Christianity and paganism. So you need to get that that set in in your mind to think theologically and if if you're going to build yourself up in the most holy faith. There's only two ways to live. There's only two destinies. There's only two worldviews. There's only one saviour. So, in this first point of building ourselves up in the most holy faith and thinking now about these issues and thinking that homosexuality and transgenderism, which we'll talk about in a second, 
is part of a group of pagan practices. So Leviticus 18, if you want to turn there, you can, you can turn there. It's worth just kind of having a little look. Leviticus 18 And verse 21, I'll just read a few of these verses, three of them. Leviticus 18 and verse 21, You shall not give any of your children to offer them to Molech, and so profane the name of your God, I am the Lord. Verse 22, You shall not lie with a male as with a woman, it is an abomination. Verse 23, And you shall not lie with with any animal, and so make yourself unclean with it. Neither shall any woman give herself to an animal to lie with it. It is a perversion. It's, it's vital, you see, to situate the Old Covenant, that's the Old Testament there, the Old Covenant witness on homosexuality within God's broader sexual ethic. You see... God's will for sex and sexuality is complementary, heterosexual, marital intimacy. In Leviticus 18, it indicates that homosexuality is set within a pagan ethic. And that is one that includes a total rejection of God's design. Killing one's children there, you see. Handing your children over to Molech. Killing one's children as opposed to caring for children. Having sex then with a member of the same sex as opposed to one's spouse in a one flesh union that was laid out in, in Genesis 1 and 2. And then pursuing sex with an animal as opposed to ruling over the animals set out in Genesis 1 and 2. You see how these are opposites to God's good design in Genesis 1 and 2. The pagan worldview is completely then opposite. And so homosexuality is then part of paganism. A non-Christian worldview. The pagan mind does not honour the distinctions between the sexes or the roles between the sexes in any way that glorifies God's design for sex and sexuality. It encourages people to indulge in their passions, their desires, their sexual appetites, whatever they might be. So you can just listen to my co-author of the book we wrote together, The Grand Design. This is Dr. Owen Strand. He says... Where God creates distinct sexes, paganism blurs them. Where God creates distinct roles, paganism denies them. Where God elevates man to a position of stewardship of the creation, paganism dethrones him and encourages him to act like a beast. So homosexuality is a pagan response to God's plan for marriage. Marriage is created complementarian, but God designed it not simply to display the beauty of earthly complementarity between a man and a woman, but to show the union of Christ and the church. That's why Paul says in Ephesians 5, verse 31 and 32, he quotes Genesis and, 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 and God's design for marriage, the two shall become one flesh, and he says, I'm telling you that that is a picture of Christ and the church. That marriage at creation is a picture of God's love in redemption. Homosexuality is a pagan response to that. And this is why, you see, Christians need to advocate for marriage in, in the public square. Human flourishing is a big concern, but more than that, marriage paints a picture of the gospel. Homosexuality denies it. Now, those who experience same-sex desire or engage in same-sex intercourse or, or marriage might not realize that, but sin arises from within, and we rarely think of the consequences before, of that sin before we engage on it. You know, it's true, isn't it, that you know, it erupts in the heart. It's true of anger, of lust, of envy, jealousy, selfish ambition, and so on. They then manifest themselves in arguments, in pornography, in murder, in lying and stealing. They start in the heart first. 
but we can't deny that some sins have a, a greater weight, as it were, than others. In Romans 1, 22 to 27, Paul talks about the creation order and the evil of homosexuality. It's worth looking at this text as well. So if you want to turn to Romans 1. I'm making us turn there because it's good for us to work our Bibles so that we know where to go. We, know, we need to know where to go in the Scriptures. You know, I speak to lots of people, and they, and they Christians this is, and they get a bit frustrated because they just know it's not right, but they haven't got the places to go in the Scriptures to show people why they believe what they believe. And so they kind of get a bit frustrated and angry, and so they become the angry Christian. And we don't want to be angry Christians. We want to be loving Christians. We want to be biblical Christians. And so we want to be able to point away from ourselves, and oh, this is just my opinion, to this is God's word. It's God's opinion. So when we look at, um, when we look at uh, Romans 1, we need to look at the text here. Let's turn to it here. Verse 22. And claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, for that reason, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. See, you can't ignore God's design for sex and sexuality from creation. We need to have a robust understanding from creation. You see, Paul traces the, the stirrings of homosexuality to a subversion of the created order. Homosexuality is a problem because it does not lead to human flourishing, but it's also a problem because it is pagan and subverts God's creation order. So watch the progression in the text. Verse 22... Man exalts himself over God, thinking himself wise. See that there? Claiming to be wise. Then he worships the creation through images. Verse 23. Then in verse 24, God then gives people over to the lusts of their hearts. Those who persist in sin, God actually gives them over to the lusts of their hearts. And then verses 25 to 27 make it clear then that sinners like us then become consumed with passion of a homosexual kind and thus give up natural relations for the homosexual behavior. And finally, you look down in verse 32 and you see this. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Indulging leads not simply to more indulgence, but to approval. So you see the progression then of sin. So it is with same-sex marriage. Legally declared as good in the UK and US and Canada and other countries now, the abnormal has been normalized. The unnatural has been naturalized. Paganism is now promoted So, when we're thinking about building ourselves up in the most holy faith, that is, scriptures, we need to keep in mind we need to build ourselves up in a biblical worldview. There is the biblical Christian worldview, there is the pagan worldview in which homosexuality is set. And also, to the paganization of sex and sexuality in the culture through the normalization of homosexuality and homosexual marriage, we also see the next big thing, transgenderism. 
transgender revolution has followed the homosexual, homosexual revolution. All in the name of civil rights, all in the name of personal equality. But you see why it's so very true to affirm this central thing of binary sexes. Because key to the transgender argument is there is more than one sex. In that in fact sex is, is, is something you might be born as biologically. But gender is something that you choose along the way. So what it, what it is to be a man and not a woman, what it is to be a woman and not a man, these are vital things to understand. And we'll talk about it a little bit in, in the parenting session, but boys must be taught and shown biblical manhood. And girls must be taught and shown biblical womanhood. How boys and girls act with the opposite sex matters. What they wear matters. But the culture, buying into the LGBT ideology, pushes a neutralization of the sexes. Adults who should protect children are actually then the ones who are engineering school systems, for example, to accept transgender ideology. At the heart of this, I want to advocate that, not in the positive sense, but I want to assert that a loss of manhood in the home and in general, is at the heart. Men have abdicated their responsibilities, but manhood is, is under attack as well. You've heard the phrase toxic masculinity? Have you, anyone? Hands up if you've heard that phrase. Yeah, you hear it all the time now. It's, it's out there in the, in the agenda that's pervading the culture, is that the, the masculinity is toxic, that men are the problem, that, that manhood is the problem. Oh, there have been abuses of manhood, absolutely. There's been abuses of male authority, but, but masculinity is not the problem. Sin is the problem. Manhood is good. Manhood is vital. Biblical manhood is vital. And so where men have abdicated their responsibilities under the attack of, as well of, of masculinity being a bad thing. And, and so take, I mean, I've spoken to guys in the, in the UK, non-Christian guys, who say to me, Gavin, we're afraid to go up to girls in the workplace and ask them for a date because we're afraid of being accused of sexual harassment. So now it's got men on the, on the back foot. So where we've seen this abdication of manhood, we see a breakdown in families. A fatherhood issue, absent fathers. Fathers who are absent of their children's lives, even if they stay in the home, they're not pressing in, or they've left the home. And so boys in particular, but girls and boys, but boys in particular grow up undisciplined, confused as to what it is to be masculine. Boys with only a mother to bring them up. We've got to have great compassion and admiration for countless single mothers out there. We have um, one or two in, in our church, and, and, and you have great compassion. But the boys in that family still crave and need a father figure. That's why the church is the answer, huh? Because it's the bigger family in which we have fathers in the church that can be that role model for, for, for those families. But much of the impetus of the transgender movement comes from boys wanting to be girls. Most studies indicate that for every one woman who transitions, as it were, to manhood, three men transition to womanhood. So transgender ideology is relatively new in our culture. And isn't it amazing the speed it's hit? talking to with lots of the youth over these last couple of days and you know they're just saying this is what we're hit with all the time in in our uh, age groups this kind of talk transgender ideology is new in our culture but what i want to make known here as with homosexuality is in fact ancient the bible speaks directly to the instinct to take on a personal identity that does not correspond with one's sex it's found in deuteronomy 22 and verse 5 deuteronomy 22 and verse 5 you can turn there it's a little bit of work for you i know it's hot but it's only turning a couple of pages come on you can do it it's early as well deuteronomy 22 and verse 5 
A woman shall not wear a man's garment, nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord your God. That's Deuteronomy 22, verse 5. Mark that. I mean, this we might call transvestitism, which is under the umbrella term of transgenderism. But the exchanging of a sexual identity is in there. It's in the text. Transsexuals are those who have actually transitioned through surgery. Okay? And we need to remember these different terms. So transgender is an umbrella term for different ways people experience or live out their gender identity. Transvestitism, the man wearing a woman's clothes, woman uh, doing the same with, with, with a male identity, is under that umbrella term. And transsexuals are those who have actually transitioned through surgery. We've got to ask the question, if it, is this Old Testament law binding today in the New Covenant? The answer is yes. Because just Deuteronomy 22 verse 5 speaks to a bigger matter than just fashion in the ancient Near East. It connects morality with biology. In other words, if you're a man, you're called by God to dress like a man in a culturally appropriate way. If you are a woman, you're called by God to dress like a woman. Your biology is destiny. Put it like that. It's a good, good little phrase to remember. Biology is destiny. Your body is not lying to you. Your anatomy is telling you who you are and who God made you to be. And so in 1 Corinthians 11, the New Testament reinforces Deuteronomy 22. Because some people say, well, that's the old covenant. Yeah, that's not binding in the new covenant. But Paul speaks of long hair in 1 Corinthians 11 and says it's a disgrace for men, but it's a glory for women. That women and men should grow their hair different lengths, according to the apostle Paul. And why is this? Because he's asserting the distinction of the sexes in a, a culturally appropriate way, even through the hair length. The man and woman united in marriage must not look the same or blur their roles in marriage. So a man must look like a man, a woman must look like a woman. And they must not blur their roles. A man must act like a man. A man must be head of his home and, 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 and take a sacrificial, loving leadership for his wife. And a wife should... Submit gladly and affirm that, that leadership positively, being his great helper and, and counsellor, but, but with a desire to follow his leadership and nurture and affirm that. A man is a, a life protector. A woman is a life giver. And so a man and woman united in marriage must not look the same nor blur the roles. And so within this 1 Corinthians 11 passage, we see even Paul talking about creation. He says, the woman was not, the man was not created for the woman, but the woman for the man. He's referring to the creation of Eve for Adam, where she was created as a helper fit for him. He was created first, she was fit for him, you see. So what he's trying to say in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 11, really affirms Deuteronomy 22 in the Old Testament says men and women are not the same and should not present themselves physically as if this is so. Do you see what, what I'm getting at here? The New Testament is affirming what Deuteronomy 22 in the Old Testament is saying. And Paul is, is also saying in taking care to honour the distinctions between the sexes, we display the order of creation with the man then as the leader of his wife. So ultimately, Paul, in 1 Corinthians 11, reinforces the creation plan of God for men and women. So his teaching is not new. See, the Corinthian church found itself in a situation like ours. Quite depraved culture. So what did Paul do? He drew the church's attention back to the goodness of God-made manhood and womanhood. 
The pagans of Corinth, they might experiment with gender fluidity, but the people of God could not. The pagans of Corinth might reject biblical roles, but the people of God could not. So you see, transgender ideology is not only disordered, it is immoral. We must not cross-dress. We must not change sexual body parts. We must not blur the boundaries between the sexes and downplay God's creative intent. I want to just say this. Expressions of manhood and womanhood, of masculinity and femininity might differ slightly in cultures, but the inclinations are still rooted in creation, not in distortions of the culture. And remember the point I made last night. At the heart of transgender ideology is a divorce of the word sex and gender. This is sex is what you're assigned at birth. Even that language, look out for that. What you are assigned at birth. You're assigned a sex at birth. No, you are a male or female. No, no, you're assigned. Sex is what you're assigned at birth. Gender is what you choose to be. And you see, this is why CBMW's work and in, in keeping, pointing the church back to complementarian sexuality, this creational meaning behind manhood and woman, it is so important. Because if sex and gender is, is culturally defined, then the cultural distortions, they just become the norm. And then who says that marriage can't be between a man and a man? And sex within marriage alone? Or that one's sex can even be changed? Because it's all just fluid. And it's all rooted in sexual paganism. And that is at the heart of the homosexual and transgender, uh, transgender agenda. So when Jude says... Keep yourselves in the love of God by building yourself up, firstly, in the most holy faith. This includes building yourself up in Christian worldview as opposed to pagan worldview. Christian worldview, pagan worldview. These things are in the pagan worldview. You've got to realize the difference. You've got to realize there's two ways to live. There's not middle ground. There's two destinations, heaven and hell. And those who follow those other ways will end up in hell. And those who have and know the love of God in the Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ and the great grace of the gospel, we know there is a good and a better way. And we must build ourselves up in the most holy faith and therefore keep ourselves in the love of God. If we're out there contending for the faith and not keeping ourselves in the love of God, we're not strong to contend. If you do that, you'll be strong to contend. Build yourself up in the most holy faith. Second is praying. Praying is the other ing word there in Jude. If you look back to Jude, I said three ing words, didn't I, that, these, that kind of describe how we keep ourselves up in the most holy, uh, sorry, in the uh, love of God. By building yourself up in the most holy faith, building, by praying in the Holy Spirit. We'll move through these a bit more quickly with a childlike affection in the heart, cry out, Abba, Father, as we intercede, as we learn to plead with God for understanding of his word. Our minds then are on his promises and his promises in his word and his promises from creation to revelation. They become sure to us. And these things in the scripture, even if they seem difficult for us to understand, as we pray, Lord, make it so. Give us understanding. We gain a security in the word. A security in its sufficiency. As we pray in the spirit. Who is the spirit of love. Romans 5. We keep ourselves in the love of God. We keep ourselves in the love of God by building ourselves up in the most holy faith. According to the scripture, keep ourselves in the love of God by praying in the spirit. So how can we not contend? And the third in word is waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we live in this eager anticipation of Christ's coming. I don't think we, as Christians, focus enough on that. Jesus is coming. And let's live in light of that. Let's live in light of the second coming. And we, it says here in verse 21... Waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ leads to 
eternal life. You see, for us, we live in eager anticipation for Jesus' coming, obeying him along the way, but knowing this one thing, when he comes, he will be merciful to me. That's how we can be eager that he's coming, because he's going to be merciful to me. There's eternal life for me. It ends well for me. So I will contend. Because I'm in the love of God. So you see those in words that keep us in the love of God. Contending means living out what we believe. And so we need to teach and model biblical sexuality in our homes and churches. And as I said, we'll talk more about training young people, our children, in these ways. What I want to say is that, you know, we need to celebrate these things in the church, you know. We need to celebrate these things. As we build ourselves up in the most holy faith, as we're praying and we're looking to be obedient in light of Christ's coming in these issues of sexuality, let's, let's celebrate with joy and present a counterculture to a crumbling and confused culture. And then what happens is the questions they ask us as they see the counterculture in the church, the way that marriages are picturing Christ in the church, the way that men are sacrificing, laying their lives down for their wives and, and children, and wives are, are submitting to husbands. I mean, you know, what, that's not going on out there. They say, why? And you say, let me tell you a story about the gospel, the Lord Jesus Christ. Because this is a picture of it here. Young men and young women living in purity, in their single years, devoted to the Christ, the bridegroom, in their single years, praying that God might, might be pleased to bring them a spouse, aspiring to that. But if he gives me singleness, then he will gift me for it, and I'll live my life to honor the bridegroom, Jesus Christ. Because one day earthly marriage will be no more when the bridegroom comes from his bride, the church. And this is what we're all pointing to, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's an interesting thing that in the darkest days outside, the Lord seems to be working most in purifying his church. And in this particular instance, we can point them to the gospel. So issues of biblical sexuality then become a mission moment, even in the church, as we rejoice in these things, keeping ourselves in the love of God, building ourselves up in the most holy faith, praying and waiting for the Lord to come. Because here's the, the rub, folks. I mentioned it last night. Verses 1 and 2 says, We are called. We are beloved. We are kept. And the end verses of Jude says, Jesus is able to keep us from stumbling and make us stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. So from the beginning to the end of the letter, you are secure when you contend. So he says, contend. You don't need to fear. I've got you. It ends well for you. And remembering this will keep you in the love of God. Stop you falling away to the subtle teachings of the false teachers in this age in which we live. That's lesson four. Keep yourself in the love of God. So it's, now we're pointing to ourselves, right? Now let's look at other people. Lesson five, we've got to extend mercy to the deceived. Mercy to others. As we've been loved, so we must love. False teachers lead people astray. Jesus really has a go at the Pharisees sometimes, doesn't he? Blind guides, sons of the devil. But there were others he was more gentle with. Those who were deceived by them. And so, think of this phrase. It's different courses for different horses. That's what we've got to use. Different courses for different horses. We need pastoral wisdom, okay? When we extend mercy to others. There's a difference between the LGBT ideology and activists and those who have been caught in the net. Okay? To ones, he says, caught in doubt. See it there in the text. To ones who are caught in doubt. Verse 22. He says, have, have mercy. Show gentleness. Don't break a bruised reed. There are some people that are experiencing same-sex attraction or transgender impulses. They hear biblical teaching. Maybe there was you know, someone here last night. They hear te biblical teaching. They, they hear some people saying that even the impulses that I, uh, come up uninvited are sinful. And some are saying it's not. They're, they're confused. They're doubting. 
Maybe they need to work it through with you. Have mercy on those who doubt. And then to others, he says, others need to be snatched from the fire, verse 22. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. This is urgent. And they need a violent wrench out of the lifestyle they're beginning to embrace. And there's allusions here to Zechariah and and Joshua the priest who was a burning stick snatched from the fire, it says, in Zechariah. These people destined for hell. They're going on the wrong path. Like the priest there, Joshua the priest, because of his filthy garments. And yet, they can be clothed with the clean garments of Christ's righteousness. There are some who, though deceived, might be saved and covered with the righteousness of Christ. If they're snatched from the fire, God might use you to do that with, with someone you know, a friend, a relative. And then, finally, in these different courses for different horses, this is biblical counselling, there are some to whom we show mercy with fear. It says there in the second part of verse 23. They are entrenched in sin. Their garment, it says, is stained by the flesh. This is a picture of the 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 filthy garments, but the stench is coming through from the inside out. So we still extend mercy, but it says extend mercy with with fear, hating even the garments stained by the flesh. And I think the, the meaning here is that we don't become soiled with their sin as we get close to them. So, so this is important to remember. You're, you're biblically counseling someone. Someone entrenched in this lifestyle of homosexuality, transgenderism. And then what happens is you get close to them as you begin to counsel them. But you must remain fearful, as it were, that you don't get soiled with their sin. You get drawn in and, and so, you know, nice people and you, you begin to empathize and suddenly you become a bit accepting of it. No, no, you must hate even the garments stained by the, the flesh even as you get close to that person. And and so you don't compromise with the sin. Very important to remember in in counselling. Love for those who are caught in sin, entrenched in sin, does not exclude hatred for the corruption of that sin. And so friends, we must have a deep concern. We should not be led astray by false teachers. And we must have an extraordinary sense of the mercy and love of Christ to us that we then extend to others. So the five lessons, three from last night, two from this morning. Number one, we must all contend, so that's everyone here who's a Christian. No one gets let off. We must all contend, secondly, for the faith. That is doctrine, with a special focus on the gospel. Third, we must all contend against false teachers. Fourth, we must keep ourselves in the love of God as we turn to this, now what should we do and how? Keep yourself right and five, then, then you're ready, you're strong to contend, to extend mercy to others. There are people being led astray by false teaching concerning homosexuality and transgenderism within the evangelical church, within reformed circles. They pervert the grace of God and deny the lordship of Jesus Christ. They attack the doctrine of sin and the doctrine of the gospel. And there are casualties from the invasion within our midst even. And so we contend by showing compassion. That's the the word here I think that Jude leaves us with. I'm going to give you two pastoral narratives from my own experience and then I'll open up to questions. The first is Leslie. And and I've I've got full permission to share this with you. Leslie is in our church in Calgary. Leslie's in his early 70s. Uh, Leslie comes to our house every year for, for, for Christmas, and he's a, he's a dear brother. He's a, he was a professing Christian, going to his church with his wife and children back in the 1990s. But he lived with a secret. He'd been exposed to pornography at 11 years old, and he'd nurtured transgender impulses from his teens. And he began to live a tra- secret transgender lifestyle when he was married and he had his children. 
He finally left his wife and children and had sex reassignment surgery. Remember I said that term transsexual is when you had the, the sex reassignment surgery paid for by the province in Canada. And he left his wife and children and he lived as a woman for 10 years in the 1990s. I say lived as a woman because you literally, you actually can't change your sex, you can't change your DNA. But he had the surgery and lived as a woman for 10 years in the 1990s. This is how Leslie describes it. He described it as a strong delusion that took over him. He bought the pagan worldview, the pagan lie, and he was living within the pagan worldview. And he said this, you, you can think of nothing else and... The more you think of it, the more you pursue it. Remember that progression in Romans. What pierced through the delusion? Truth pierced through the delusion. The truth of God in the book of Romans. He pulled him back from the brink of hell. Was he backslidden? Was he even saved then? He's not sure, but he is sure he's saved now. It was the gospel of God in Romans that pulled him out of the fire and into the kingdom of his beloved son. It was the counsel of a man in our church then, as that man then brought us him to our church and where he's been discipled then, brought him into the love of the church. That then the Lord purged him, even took away the desire. He realized that, that the impulses, not just the action, was sinful. He realized his identity in Christ now as a Christian. And Leslie repented deeply. By God's grace, he did save him. The casualties were that he did lose his wife and children and, and he bears mental and physical scars from that. He lives with consequences and we as a church family come round him to, to comfort him in these moments where he gets low. Family was still not speaking to him up until one night, one month ago, and he was on Facebook and he saw his daughter, who he'd not spoken to since the 1990s, that's a long time, she was on there and he privately just, he messaged her, thinking she wouldn't reply, and she messaged him back. And they had this conversation for about an hour on Facebook, private messaging, and he said to me, he said, I, I told her I was crying, and he said I was telling her things and saying, you know, how I'd sinned against her and her, her mother and she was, said she was crying and, and there was this conversation that went on and, and so even now the Lord's working in Leslie's life and, and the great thing is this the church at Calvary Grace is his family we need to emphasize the church's family because in all the brokenness out there we have singles and we have people from broken homes we have men and women who've indulged in in, in sexual immorality and, and, and they bear the consequences but in the church as the bigger family we have brothers and sisters we have mothers and fathers and so Leslie who can often get down because he's not uh, even able to be a father as it were to his children now we say Leslie you are a father in our church and he's shared his testimony with lots of young guys and lots of men in our church and he's an inspiration to them of the power of the gospel and, and the hope that that all men and women can have in the gospel, that Leslie can now be a father in our church. And, and a couple of years ago, after a midweek teaching session that I was doing with our men on sexual immorality, Leslie asked to speak with me. He said, I really feel convicted to tell of God's grace, to tell of God's grace to, to me and the danger of deception of this pagan teaching, this false teaching. And, and the night came, we had about 50 men, all different ages, and I, I'd worked through his testimony with him and I was praying, Lord, don't let these guys, because there were men from other churches that didn't know anything about his background, don't let them look down on him as a Pharisee saying, you know, I'm glad I'm not like that tax collector. And he, he gave his testimony and to a man, every one of those men, young and old, were just blown away by Leslie's testimony and respected him and obviously the power of the gospel. The truth of the gospel saved him and sanctified him. The prayers and love of the saints helped him. That's one testimony. And I've been privileged to work with Leslie and counsel him along the way. Second, a young man in, in my congregation came up to me two years ago and he confessed to experiencing same-sex attraction and he was watching gay pornography. He was in that 
second category in Jude. He hadn't pursued uh, a relationship with a man, but he needs to be snatched from the fire. We immediately put him under a church discipline, firm but with compassion because he had come forward. He had confessed and he seemed submissive. I worked with him for over 18 months and we worked through God's purposes for sexuality from Genesis all the way through to, to Revelation. We worked at getting to the heart issues behind why he was feeling what he was feeling. And by God's grace, he repented and fought and found freedom and joy. And you know what? He has recently married a woman in our church and they're expecting their first child. That's remarkable. Now, it's not always the case that someone who experiences same-sex attraction and, and they repent that, that, that they would end up marrying a, a, a woman or a woman would end up marrying a man. Not always the case. But the question is, are they fighting? Just as all of us, are we fighting? Are we fighting the lusts of our hearts? With the eyes on Jesus and, and our hope in Christ and by the power of the Spirit and according to his word. With this young man, there was a great victory. I asked him, I said, what did you find helpful in your counseling? Here's what he said. Number one, It was incredibly helpful that we developed a relationship and you didn't just dump information on me. In time, you were able to identify and encourage growth and it helped me to trust you when you said things that challenged how I thought about myself. So there is a, there's the, that, that mercy aspect. You come in, in alongside someone, there's a a relationship of sort that's developed there. That'll vary but it helps you to say those things because they know you care about them as a person. Second, he said, I remember at one point we discussed, and remember this was key last night, we discussed whether the same-sex desire was itself sinful. That really confronted me because I had justified my sinful thoughts and actions because of my desire. You see that? Oh, it's just the way I am. I I experience these things. It's just my orientation. He said, even in the counselling process, my identity was so wrapped up in my quote-unquote sexual orientation, it was a challenge not to use that as an excuse for anything that was different. And then he said, thirdly, we talked about putting off and putting on. That is like Colossians 3. When you... Colossians 3, Paul talks about put off and put on. If you're in Christ, you put off these sins and you put on these attributes of Christ because you're in Christ. He said, I, I, I approach issues of sexuality with a gospel framework. This is important for us when we're counseling. If we identify that person, you know, they're saying there's a, they're a Christian. He says in Colossians 3, verse 1, if then you've been raised with Christ, if then... Seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. He said, this is very helpful because I knew I had to stop my bad habits. But what I didn't realize, put off is stop the bad habits. But what I didn't realize with the putting on is how much I had to grow in seeking good habits. I didn't realize that by escaping to my sexual fantasy world, I was actually ignoring the joy of living and the steward in the gifts that God had given me. Isn't that amazing? He actually saw he was missing out on joy. That's what we want people to see. You know what? You're actually missing out on joy. So he finally saw that in the scriptures and in other godly examples around him. That God's design leads to true joy. So, brothers and sisters here today, one of the keys in counseling, those who confess homosexual, transgender, or even heterosexual lusts, we must num- remember, number one, in mercy come alongside them as redeemed, a redeemed sinner. sinner. If they're, they're a Christian, that's the case. If, if, if they're not, they need to be saved first. They need the gospel. In doing that, you can convey to them that we're more alike than unalike. It doesn't excuse sin, but it points us to the one hope that's in Christ. That's the first thing. Secondly, identify the location of the sin. Confront the sin at impulse level. Thirdly, point them to their identity in Christ, not identity in sexual orientation or patterns of desires. And fourth, give them biblical technique. Give them Colossians 3. If you're in Christ, put off, put on. 
practice these things. To do this, you need to know the scriptures. You need to know the faith you're contending for. You need to be a people of prayer. You need to keep your own life on track in view of Jesus' coming. Knowing you've received mercy, you must extend mercy. But you need different courses of mercy for different horses. Some are confused and they need a more gentle approach. Some are about to be burned to death and they need a violent wrench. Some are deeply entrenched and lost in sin. And down you go, hating the sin and intent on affecting them with grace, not being affected by their sin. I think we would do well to heed the words of A.W. Tozer. He said this, Some of you are so nice you're no good. He didn't mess around, Tozer. He's quite direct. In this awful day of so-called tolerance, get your teeth sharpened. We're not called to smile and smile and smile. Sometimes we're called to frown and rebuke. To contend, not be contentious, to destroy error but not harm people. See, there is a war against God and his people. There is a, a Trojan horse filled with doctrinal error that's entered the evangelical city. I talked about that last night. And we must contend. Jude gives us lessons. But remember, Jesus gives us the victory. Because in the book of Revelation, Jesus comes in on a different horse. Not a Trojan horse. But he comes in on a white horse. He comes in on a white horse and he's ruling and reigning and from his mouth is a sharp sword and he is called the word of God and he will have his victory and that is the Jesus who is the captain of our soul that is the Jesus who is our saviour that is the Jesus who is coming again the one who will build his church and we're just called to be faithful along the way Amen I'm going to uh, open it up now to questions for a few minutes any questions you've got on this issue, on the two sessions, or just this one, the last two lessons here, on how we engage here? I think we've got mics going around. Morning, how are you? Hi. Good? Good to see you. All right. Um, one of my very good friends is gay, and yeah. he's Muslim. Could you hold that right up there? Can you hear Thank you. So one of my very good friends is gay and Muslim. So the question when I try to confront him is, do I confront the behavior of homosexuality? Because he will tell me about his boyfriends and his encounters. Mm -hmm. Do I stop it and say, oh, I don't want to hear that? Or do I, I mean, where do I become the person who is too nice? Yes. And acquiescing to his behavior? Yes. Because if I just stop him, then he's going to stop the relationship. Yes. And the evangelism opportunity is gone. Yeah. Yeah, I mean... What we, have to, we have to be real and realistic and say that, you know, as we engage with people, people who are even acquaintances or, or friends, that as we put forth the Christian worldview, because remember it's the two worldviews that are clashing, that some will harden and some will be offended and some will walk away. And this is what makes contending hard, right? Because contending might mean that you might lose some relationships as you act in love for people. And, and probably many people in here have experienced that, maybe with families that are not, family members are not Christians, and you've, you've tried to give them the gospel and they got offended and pulled back. Um, but with this gentleman, obviously they need to be saved first, they need the gospel. Yeah? They need, they need the gospel. So, so you, your, your first uh, requirement would be to bring them Christ and the gospel, to engage him on Jesus Christ and his need for Christ as the one true saviour. Um, that would be the way that, that I would approach this. Now, if it comes with regards to you know, issues of sexuality and what the Bible says, and, and then you can point him to what Jesus says in Matthew 19 about sex and sexuality and how Jesus points to creation and Jesus points to marriage between a man and a woman and, and that. But, but I'd be first looking, he needs to be saved, he needs a new heart. And then if he's a new creation, he actually has the ability to then repent deeply and, and, and follow God's pattern. So it seems like, again, you know, this needs wisdom in terms of what you seem to have, have a, a, for a, an acquaintance or re relationship with this person for, for a while. So you have a, maybe a certain kind of cachet there. You have a certain credibility, as it were, to actually press the issues. But at some stage, you, you're called to... To, to press them, bring the gospel, 
and the gospel truths that come with that. So pray about it and then dive in. And it interests, you know, I pray that God opens a door. You know, Colossians 4. Pray for us, Paul says, that God would open a door, that word might go through. So you're praying for this, that the Lord would open a door and you would see it and in you go. And it might seem less awkward than you thought it might be. And if, you, if you're determined to obey God's word and contend out a love for this person, the, the Lord will, will honor that. It might not, it's not guaranteed the person will be saved, but he'll honor your efforts. Hey, um, thanks for the teaching. I have a, like, quite a perplexing question I've been thinking on for a while. Um, who's going to uh, win the Premier League? <laughs> Just kidding. I knew you were going to say that when you, when you built that up. Well, that's easy. Chelsea. No, next question. No, actually, it's probably Manchester City, but go ahead. Yeah. Um, so um, my question is, as Christians are contending also outside the church in public realms, what would be the ideal circumstance they contend for in a world where they're legalizing same-sex marriage and those things. Because on the other side of the spectrum, you have countries which criminalize any uh, same-sex behavior or any knowledge of it, and it's very shunned upon yeah. in that sense. Yeah. And uh, along that spectrum, where should Christians land for a God-honoring structuring of society for those who have the privilege to operate in those realms where they uh, make the laws and influence the laws in certain yeah, ways? Yeah, that's a very good question and well, and well articulated. I probably won't be able to answer it fully in the, in the time that we've got, but, but I think Christians should be advocating in the right... Well, first of all, we need to get it right in the church, okay? This is the first thing. We need to be right in here. Um, and then I think we need, to, we need to advocate through appropriate means and, and channels for um, marriage between one man and one woman um, as being the foundation for societies for hundreds and hundreds of years. The foundation of society has been, and, and for the propagation of society, has been marriage. Because marriage as well produces children and marriage being that sort of building block. Um, and, and appealing on those levels as well to, to, to the broader uh, culture, I think shows that Marriage in God's common grace, it blesses cultures when you adhere to God's creation order in marriage. And, and that, without getting into it, that when we disobey that and when we move to homosexual marriage, to transgender policies and agendas, it's now affecting all areas of life. It's affecting uh, legal issues and... Um, restructuring of law, not just on the law of, uh, of marriage between a man and a woman, but all sorts of other laws, all sorts of other areas, toilets and, um, and other things like that. You know, do, 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 we, do we have now male and female toilets? Do we have just shared toilets? What about in schools? Um, now in schools, should, you, know, you should have these gay straight alliances, which are safe places where people now affirm their homosexuality is good. You know, all of these spin-offs from it, that then cause a confusion in the culture. So you can appeal from your own Christian standpoint, but also then appeal from a common grace uh, standpoint that marriage blesses societies when it's adhered to and has been the foundation for hundreds of years. And it's been, it's been overturned in the last, what, 10 or 15, which is remarkable. There's obviously more to say on that, but I think that would be my, my, my foundational. Yes, Tim. Am I correct in understanding that laws against sodomy probably originated in Judeo-Christian countries, yeah. seeking to submit to the, the creator's design that that was actually best to protect the vulnerable, the innocent, yeah. and society in love, to actually yeah. have laws against sodomy? Yeah, I, th I think that you're... That that was Christian in origin, that was not yeah. uh, something other... Yeah, it wasn't pagan. Pagans didn't have, didn't come up with those laws. No, so pa paganism, as I tried to outline there, was is is against God's order, and so what Pastor Tim is saying is that certain countries that have outlawed that. I, I mean, I'm not sure whether it's every country it originated. Are, are you sure of that fact, or that every country that 
made it illegal would be... Think that that was so. Mm. Sodomy, that mm. word doesn't even get used anymore. Mm. Mm. But we have to look back and say, where did those laws originate? Properly understood, properly yeah. applied. Yeah. Not wrongly, not all the abuses, but the abuse of a thing doesn't invalidate the thing itself. No. And you shouldn't use food or drink or, or sleep either. So, yeah, what would legitimate laws against sodomy look like? I'm sure Gavin would love to answer that. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. But remember like, what I said, were you here last night? Okay, so I said, you know, not that long ago, we described it by, you know, we talk about gay, gay sex, we described it by the act, sodomy. Then it moved um, from an act to a, a condition, homosexuality, a psychological condition. And then it, it moved from the condition um, to an identity, gay. Acts to condition to identity. Once gayness is an identity, then it becomes a human rights issue, a social justice issue. But it was actually, used to be described as it was in the scripture, men who practiced homosexuality by, by the act. And so there's been a subtle shift in, in the language that then has made it, um, even as, as Pastor Tim was saying there, um, unpalatable for us to even think that once it was I I illegal, in countries, but of course that comes from a scriptural view that it's it's not a good and right thing. It's against God's law, and it's not good for for humankind. Yeah, there's a gentleman. Hi, uh, Gavin. Thanks for the talk. I wasn't here last night, so you might have covered some of the question I'm about oh. to ask. Uh, being from Canada, you of course recently had the LGBT community pushing for pronouns yeah. who, that, describe them, <clears throat> me, that describe them specifically. Yeah. And Jordan Peterson, of course, yeah. fought very strongly against the introduction of that legislation. So I guess the question is, in a world which is becoming increasingly pluralistic and increasingly uh, vague about definitions of male, female sexuality, how does the church avoid going down the path of litigation ultimately? Uh, and avoid what? The Sorry. path of litigation, the path of being sued yeah. and the path of being shut down yeah. for its closely held beliefs. Yeah. And how does the church avoid becoming a place that ultimately sees large demonstrations outside by the LGBT community as a place which is essentially just stuck in the Middle Ages or whatever the case might be yeah. and remains a place where the LGBT community finds a path to Christ. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think we need to have the right attitude, and I think Jude sets it out. I mean, Jude's, the letter of Jude there is a pretty sparky letter. I mean, it's, it's tough speech, yeah? No wonder they only gave him one letter. Um, but it does, it is in, like, like last night I unpacked, it's in the context of love, and it's very much with an angle upon mercy. And, and so in the church, we must have that. So, we welcome all people to come in to, to our church um, to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everyone needs Jesus, everyone in the world. Um, but of course, Jesus saves us to be conformed to his image, um, not to be continuing in our uh, passions and lusts of the heart, whatever that might be. Um, what the culture is convinced those in the LGBT com community is that they are victims of oppression. So you're dealing with that. Uh, I'm, and, and so that, that we almost feel like we're apologizing when we press what is good and true and right. So we must have the right heart disposition. But I also want to, and there are, have been churches that have been, you know, the angry LGBT churches and, you know, all of that clearly. But the, lots of Christians I speak to, lot, lots of Christians, they, they earnestly desire the salvation of folk who are caught in that trap and who are caught in the, in the deception. And, and, they, and so don't necessarily buy into what the, the culture, oh yeah, the church is, is all like this, it's all angry, it's all against. No, we want to welcome everyone, we want to teach what is true. I think we really need to display the truth joyfully. Uh, within the church, within our relationships. I think that's very, very important because it's, it's very winsome as well. 
Um, and we need to be praying, praying very, very hard that God would change hearts, that God would change a, a person who comes into the church. And as uh, I've sort of illustrated to you, these are, these are real-life cases that I've dealt with where I've seen the power of God um, changing the hearts of these men and, uh, and they've actually, you know, are beginning to adhere or have adhered to God's pattern. Um, so was, that, was there another part to that question that I've missed? Did, it, did you say one other bit? You said how to avoid being yeah, I guess un- unaccepting. Part of the question was how do we avoid, as a Christian community, being shut down legally? Oh, yeah, being shut down. You've got to be wise. At the same time, you've got to be truthful. So, I mean, you see it all the time now. The governments are pulling resources from Christian universities unless they affirm homosexual marriage, for instance. They'll pull funding. Well, then you have to let that... That's going to happen. That's why I'm saying, you know, we will be called illegal. You might see a pastor go to prison on, this, on these issues. And we must be prepared for that. That's what contending is about. So we're not unnecessarily going out there to be contentious, to really up, upset people, but with a patient, firm love, we adhere to the scriptures. So transgender pronouns, difficult. You know, how, what do you do? Do you, do you call the person who says, I, you know, a, a woman sitting there that says, no, I am a man, and you must call me he. So we're now, it, the thing that Jordan Peterson um, rejected was the forced speech. He said, I may or may not call a transgender student by their preferred pronoun, but what I won't have is the government in an Orwellian style, which is, this is what's happening, George Orwell, is, is, now it's forced speech. You must now do this. And he said, no, I will not, because that is wrong. Because now freedom of speech, freedom of religion, that becomes uh, the issue. But if there's a woman there and she says, um, you know, you must call me he, when she's clearly a woman, I cannot lie. I cannot lie and affirm that woman in her delusion at the same time lying and saying he. I might call that person by their name, but I won't call them he. And so I might make that distinction and explain along the way why I, I cannot. So, needs wisdom. Yes, when And Gavin, um, this kind of a follow-up to yeah. your previous question. I'm, uh, I'm a church in America and I want to avoid litigation and I want to be merciful. And so we start this movement called Living Out, you may have heard of it, where you're, you're welcome in our church, we, we will call you gay Christian, yeah. and all you have to do is commit to celibacy, yeah. and you're all ours, and you'll hear the gospel. Yeah. So um, is that taking mercy a bit too far? Yeah. Well, the Living Out movement is, you know, they have basically what I was referring to last night when I was speaking about Revoice, which was affirming the, great, the gay Christian um, identity. They say, you know, you don't follow the lifestyle, but you can, uh, you can be affirmed by saying gay Christian, LGBT Christian, um, as long as you don't follow the lifestyle. I see uh, living out um, as, a, as a bit of a compromise along that route as well. So I don't think that's having mercy. I think that is actually buying into the deception a little in the name of love but not being discerning and this is this is why we need great discernment in our age we need massive discernment really calls for discernment because such is the press mercy mercy love love we've forgotten what love is love is defined vertically by who god is first and if we start looking too much in a man-centered way horizontal we will be drawn into the, in the name of mercy, compromising on what is truth. And that, in the end, is not merciful to people. It's actually affirming them in deceptions or sort of forms of that deception that just then increasingly move towards it. So um, the stuff last night is so key. It's a key in understanding what is sin and the nature of sin and, and how we deal with it as, as Christians. Yep. Question um, concerning... Um uh, more conservative um, cultures um, that haven't um, been exposed as much um, to the, um, the whole LGBT uh, movement. Um, when they get, uh, when they get um, um, maybe um, uh, attachments maybe to the donor funding um, to change their laws within those um, countries or within those nations, um, what should be the response um, at the high level um, with the government in terms of um, getting at, um, um, changing the laws 
um, with also maybe getting attachments, maybe being forced to change the, um, the laws, and then at the same time also getting aid um, into the country. And then the, uh, the other um, side of it, uh, what principles um, can maybe um, a Christian within those nations um, actually respond um, or use um, in, in a way to differentiate um, them from everyone else in, in terms of just hating um, male-to-male, um, male female-to-female relationships, um, but then in a godly way um, have a biblical response to that. Not just reject it as yeah. um, that's not human, uh, we don't do that, but then actually have a biblical um, response to that. Okay. You know that question you just answered, uh, asked me there. Could you sum that up in one line for me? <laughs> in two points. So basically... Um, Loudly, how, like shout, because I've got a bit of noise in here. And um, how to respond in a, a more conservative um, culture to um, um, and a, a push from outside. Um, yeah, basically. How to respond yes. as Christians yes. in a culture that's um, very conservative, that is conservative, um, rejects homosexuality, right. but has been forced to change the laws. Yeah. Um, and then the other side was um, basically, um, I, I might grow up not actually um, um, I, looking at male to male relationships as, as bad, but yeah. then I might just respond to that as the norm but then not in a biblical sense. So what principles can I use uh, in those cultures that I've grown up in just not looking at that in the right way, um, but then now um, I can now say this is um, biblically wrong. What principles can I guard myself from just saying this is bad, but then actually now having a biblical filter? Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, you know, the, we need Sorry, to... Sorry, Gavin, I, uh, just because uh, there are aspects of this question as well. Like, as we both come from really conservative countries, yeah. and so often when we are supposed to get donor funding, because uh, we come from poor countries, when we're supposed to get donor funding, uh, sometimes there are requirements to change your laws so that you can receive that donor funding. So what should the response of the country be? And then also in those countries, we have people who hate and kill over homosexuality. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How can we respond to that while being different yeah. as Christians? Yeah, so you're saying that the country, the government, has comp compromised its principles on these things for the sake of funding. Is that what you're saying? They've, to, get, to get money, they've changed their laws. Yes, how can Christians respond to that? Yeah, I know, but that's what you're saying has happened. So kind of like, you know, putting it in another way, a Christian college that has compromised its stand on homosexuality and says, okay, that's okay, just so that they get funding. Same kind of principle. How do we then respond to that as Christians, is what you're saying in that, in that country. Um, well, I think we need to as Christians um, affirm that we do what we do um, out of love for God and for God's word and that um, we want to do it with all integrity, um, not doing things to get money or you know, social status gain in any way. Um, I don't know in, in the country you're speaking about how much voice Christians would have with the, with the governmental policies, but it's certainly in terms of the second part where you've talked about some people killing others uh, in the name of homosexuality, against homosexuality, we as Christians must affirm that all people are created in the image of God, that, that, that murder is wrong, that, that, um, that hate against a fellow human being no matter what they are indulging is, is a wrong thing, and that as Christians that we can we can disagree with someone, but that doesn't mean say we hate if we disagree, if we put forth God's opinion. It doesn't mean to say we hate them. In fact, we put it forth in the name of love. It's our, our assertion of the truth is redemptive. It, it, it's loving. Okay? So we can actually show the right way to, to deal with homosexual, transgender folk around us that doesn't involve uh, bullying or uh, oppression, or in the end, murder. And it actually shows the right way to, to deal with these things. The government side of things, I'm probably a little bit less clear on. I need to probably speak to you afterwards to understand a bit more, rather than give you an answer that's 
wrong. Uh, 10, 22. Any, and any more questions before we finish? I think. Oh, is it? Sorry, my my clock is slow. Okay. Do you want to, do you want me to finish now? I was one more here from this young lady. Uh, one question I'd like to ask. I've put 1.5. Can you put uh, the mic close? Really. Close. Um, I've been told before that people who have not had biblical manhood and womanhood in their lives, so they had father figures or mothers or people in their lives, older people who didn't fill the roles they did, but um, who were deeply hurt by people in their lives yep. and still have unforgiveness issues, yep. that this can play, play a role in either rejecting yep. biblical manhood and womanhood and that being one of the roots yep. of embracing homosexuality. Have yep. you found this in your counseling? And along with that, have you found that feminism actually feeds, um, at least in some women, towards yeah. LGBT? Yes and yes. And I think they're, they're really good questions. I'll talk a little bit about feminism in the, in the next session. Uh, radical feminism is at root uh, in line with pagan sexuality. Um, and yes, in terms of the uh, unforgiveness because of how they've been treated or the roles that models, the, the anti-biblical manhood and womanhood role models. And that's why we need to keep very focused on the gospel at all times because at the heart of the gospel is the ability to forgive. And, that, and I remember I spoke to you about the, here the example of the same-sex attracted guy and we got to the root of the issues behind the issues. And the gospel is the answer because gospel, you know, you release it, it pops a bubble of anger and unforgiveness and then other things start to unravel for them. So I think that's a perceptive uh, observation and that's why we need to be, keep all of our counselling uh, focused ultimately on hope and, and power in the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs>